can turn to 
So if it's a success principle, it came from God. There is the proof right there. And Barnabas uh, loved the Lord. He was a he was a devoted Christian. I'll read uh, I'll read with you uh, uh, Acts chapter four, uh, verses thirty six and thirty seven. Let's see. If I don't have Boom. It's on the screen. If you don't want to go to your Bible, that's the King James Version. And we'll start there. 36 and 37. And Joseph, that was Barnabas' real name, J-O-S-E-S, -E Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas. They named him Barnabas. Which is being interpreted the <coughs> son of consolation. What's the key word in that consolation? Console, comfort, encourage. You get it? The apostles knew already how encouraging he was. And so they named and they nicknamed him a name that stood for the word consolation. A Levite and of the uh, country of, uh, of Cyprus. Having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Well, uh, we, uh, we'll start there and we'll talk about how to encourage others. How to encourage others. Barnabas, as we said, that was his real name. Uh, and uh, and uh, it came from the fact that they named him uh, Encourager. Barnabas the Encourager. Did you see the word consolation in there? I'm sure you did. What does encouragement do for you? Why? Why? Did Barnabas uh, emphasize encouragement? What did it do for the Christians that he got around? Well, it lightened their load, doesn't it? It still does. If you've got a heavy burden, guess what? If you're encouraged, I promise you, if you go out today and you encourage somebody that's having a tough time, their load will get lighter. Their load will get lighter. Um, it lifts their spirit. It changes their, here's the key word, attitude. Encouragement changes my whole life attitude, my picture of things. And another thing it does, it dispels, it dispels discouragement. It, uh, it puts a stumbling block before discouragement. Encouragement. So, uh, and by the way, if God is the Father of all encouragement, who do you think is the Father of all discouragement? Mm -hmm. Satan. Sure. Satan's the Father of that. If you're discouraged today and can't get over it, you need to pray that Satan will leave you alone. That's where it's coming from. He wants you to be discouraged. Why? Because discouragement, if you're not encouraged, you know what it does. First of all, it opens the door to laziness. You'll just quit doing anything if you're discouraged and depressed. You won't, you won't hit a lick, a lick of a snake, as the old boy said. But it's even worse than that. It leads you to other sinners. <laughs> discouraged. I'll, I'll hand is the devil's workshop, my mama used to tell me. And so when you're discouraged, you don't do much. You're idle, and the next thing you know, you're in trouble. It's the, uh, it opens the door to failures in our life. Here, listen, let me give you a quote. Boy, this is good if you think about it. In fact, <laughs> I saw where at least three people have claimed to have been the origin of this quote. So <laughs> you know that can't be the truth. I don't know who came up with it first, but let me give it to you. Discouragement is the dark room where the negatives of failure are developed. That's pretty strong, isn't it? A dark room is where the pictures get developed, right? You remember the old day? I guess they still do it that way. They take the negatives in, turn, turn the lights off, take the negatives in, do some dipping and stuff, and it comes out to be in a picture. Well, that's discouragement is the dark room where the negatives of failure are developed, and I believe that. There's not a problem that you have or that I have that encouragement won't help with. Not a problem. There's not a problem that this church has that encouragement won't help with. There's not a problem with evangelization that encouragement won't help. You think about it, if you're talking to somebody who doesn't know the Lord, he doesn't give you the time of day, uh, he doesn't want to hear what you have to say, but I promise you, if you start encouraging him, truthfully, you start encouraging him, he'll want to be around you. You'll see it. You'll, they'll cling to you. They'll trust you. They'll lean on you and like you. And that opens the door to effectiveness. And then later you can talk to them. That's exactly what the first century Christians did. That's what Barnabas did here. Uh, all of his life he went around encouraging people. They said, man, we like that guy. 
What else you got to say to us, Barnabas? Boom, he would talk about the Lord. And it exploded, remember? In the first century, the church exploded. That's part of it right there. It's part of it. They would, they would want to be around him. So there's the purpose. You know what? Barnabas was quite a guy. In fact, if you study his life, oh, was he instrumental. He was instrumental in the life of Paul. Very instrumental. In fact, had it not been for a Barnabas, I dare say there may not have been a Paul. I'll tell you about that. Uh, he was instrumental in Mark. He was instrumental in a lot of other people. But you know what? Barnabas never wrote a book in the Bible, did he? No. And Paul wrote 13. The guy he had to be encouraged. In fact, the guy that came to him for encouragement uh, uh, wrote 13 books. Mark, he encouraged Mark. He wrote one. Barnabas never started a church. <laughs> the encourager never started of his own a church. He never pastored a church that we know of. But the people that he encouraged did. Does that tell you something? Yeah, it tells me an awful lot. I need to learn more about how to encourage people. Encouragement is a major part of our growth and of a church's growth as well. So, today what I wish to do is give us some, uh, some ways, some ways, if I'm looking for a title today, it might be how to encourage others, and I'll give us some ways to do that. Four ways to encourage people. Okay, if you're taking notes, you ought to take notes today. This is good stuff. This is stuff that you can share with anybody, anytime. And they'll say, man, what a genius you are. <laughs> Four ways to encourage others. Number one, be a friend. Be a friend. The background on Saul, uh, uh, who later became Paul, you know it, but I'll refresh your memory real quickly. Saul, you remember, was an Orthodox Jew. And I mean a solid gold 16 ounces to the pound Orthodox Jew. He believed in everything the Orthodox Jews believed and hated everything that the Christians stood for. When he found out about Jesus, he was all against that. No, no, no. We don't want a, a Messiah coming in here and taking over. Saul was just like the rest of them. He said, that guy is out to get us politically and, and uh, militarily and every other way. He's out to get us, so let's do all we can to disparage and discourage all of those Christians. In fact, Paul was, was uh, if he didn't kill any of the Christians, he at least signed the papers and helped the ones that did it. He was an accessory to the fact, we might say. And when he got saved, he was on the way to a town called Damascus to pick up some legal papers from the priest, high priest, judge type dude, to be able to go and pick up uh, captives and take them back to be killed. That's exactly what he was doing on the way to Damascus. And what happened? Boom! You know the story. Bright light appeared. And a uh, long story, and I'll be short, but at any rate, Jesus appeared to him. Appeared. Now, was, it, was he actually there in the flesh? No, but he appeared to him there. That's how Paul was able to say he was an apostle. You know, apostles in the first century had to have been in contact, face to face. They had to have met Jesus to be an apostle in the first century. Paul was the only one that didn't. But he told them, he said, I met him. I met him on the road to Damascus. He was there just as sure as you're there. He saw him and, I, and they said, okay. So he was an apostle also. And he got saved. But you know what? No, none of the Orthodox Jews around him that he wanted to try to convince about Jesus trusted him. They wouldn't listen to him. I mean, they saw him coming and they run. They think, this guy's out to get us. They're out to, he's out to kill us. He might think we're one of them. And so no one would listen to him because they didn't trust him. Acts chapter 9 uh, tells that story real quickly. And so it's a somewhat of a long passage, but there's a purpose for it. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. He didn't eat for three days. Paul didn't. Saul didn't. Uh, and was blind, actually, too. You know that story. And I asked and all that and got his sight back. He regained his strength. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some days. He stayed around after he got saved. Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus. Man alive, he got saved at 2 o'clock, and at 3 o'clock he was preaching. <laughs> Immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. He is the Son of God, he said. But all who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man who called on this name and then came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul grew more capable and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proclaiming 
that Jesus is the Messiah. He wouldn't quit. He wouldn't quit. After many days had passed, the Jews got mad. They conspired to kill him, and that's a whole other story. But at any rate, he had to leave town in a hurry. Remember the basket over the wall? And he got in the basket, and boom, he was gone just through the middle of the night. And he went to Jerusalem then. The, the, some passages tell us why he went to Jerusalem. One, he just wanted to get out of Dodge. But there was another reason why he went to Jerusalem. You remember, uh, he had heard of Peter and James and John and those guys. And he knew that Peter, James, and John had walked with Jesus, and talked with Jesus, and knew him. And he had not. And he didn't spend three and a half years with him. And so he wanted to talk with Peter and James and John and be around them and learn from them. Maybe he wanted to learn a little bit about preaching or whatnot. And, uh, or he certainly wanted to talk with somebody who had seen him. And so he went to Jerusalem. But guess what? The same thing happened there that happened back in, uh, uh, happened back in Damascus. They did, including the disciples. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. Not Peter, James, and Paul either. Now, man, I don't know about that. And they sort of, the Bible says, how does it say it? Has it say? Anyway, they didn't trust him. Uh, they didn't trust him. And so uh, they were afraid of him. That's what it said in Acts. They were afraid of him since they did not believe he was a disciple. But Barnabas, <laughs> old Barnabas, the encourager, was standing around. He saw what happened. And he had heard Saul preach. And he heard his testimony. And he knew all about Saul. And so Barnabas, however, took him, that's Paul, and brought him to the apostles, that's Peter and James and John and all the rest of them, brought him to them and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and the, the, he had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Well, guess what it says next verse. Saul was coming and going with them after that. And Peter, James, and John said, Okay, Barnabas, we believe you. But Barnabas the encourager spoke up and vouched for Saul. He encouraged Saul, I'm sure, he did more than that. He became his friend, didn't he? He became his friend instantly. A long passage, but I want you to see a couple of things. Number one, especially in new believers, sometimes you just need a friend. You see, when a guy gets saved, his, his old friends disappear for the most part. Boom! They're gone. You can't find them at all. They start talking about you know what that guy did. Man, he's into that religion stuff now. And then disappear. So new believers need a friend. Sometimes old believers need a friend too, don't we? Yeah, been around a while and more. We just we get the old knees and the mully grubs and whatever, and we need a friend. Always the unsaved needs a friend. Always. Uh, did you see there Paul needed a friend? And Barnabas vouched for him. Barnabas stood up and became his friend instantly. I wonder, I just wonder. How many books of the Bible Paul would have written had uh, Barnabas not stood up for him? Because you see, the, the, in Jerusalem, the ruling council, if you will, uh, was made up of uh, people like Oregon and Augustus and, and uh, all of those guys, the founding fathers and the disciples. And they wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't teach him. They wouldn't help him. They wouldn't take time with him because they were afraid of him. And Barnabas stood up and boom, I am sure that they mentored him. They helped Paul become the man that he had became and wrote to Paul those books in the Bible. I just wonder how many of them he would have written had it not been for his friend Barnabas. I wonder what Mark would have done without Barnabas. Paul understood friendship. He understood consolation. In fact, he started preaching that right away. I, I read, by the way, in fact, we were talking about this today earlier with someone. I've read that uh, psychiatrists and psychologists claim that 70% of the American, 70% of everybody like us, the American population, are chronically lonely. Won't admit it, but they're lonely. They don't have one or two people they can really call from. And they're lonely. And sometimes that lonely spills over into all kinds of problems. We won't go there, but they need a friend. 70% of the people that you and I bump shoulders with need a friend. That ought to tell you something. Babies, they claim that when babies are born, the first year, 
<laughs> to the babies in the crib. You know, all that hugging and kissing and cooing and loving and, and all that sort of stuff, the, the contact time, the eye contact, all of that. You better do it. You better do it. Because psychiatrists say that a child that didn't get some of that in the first year of life, for whatever reason, nine times out of ten ends up cold and detached emotionally. Not adjusted, even brutal sometimes, even abusive sometimes. And they say, you can't spoil a baby. You can't do too much to a baby to spoil in the first year. After that, maybe you can. But the first year, you can't do too much. And I'll say that for a Christian, for a new Christian. You can't do too much. You can't be too good of a friend to a newbie. You just can't spoil it. Let's, let's just do this, Central Baptist Church. Why don't we in the next few years decide and determine if we're going to go out and spoil some people. We're going to go out and spoil some people with friendliness. I, in fact, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put our membership role out there in the, in the foyer. And up, I want you to update the information if it's wrong. Uh, and then we're going to take the uh, try to establish a rule of people that come frequently and do the same thing, get their contact information, and start the ladies' luncheon back again, and other anything I can think of that will allow us to defri to befriend people, to befriend people around here. That's what I want to do. Well, brother Tom, I don't know how to I don't know how to make friends. I don't have any friends because I don't know how to make them. Proverbs 18. Uh, if you, uh, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. <laughs> if you want friends, be a friend. That's what it's saying right there. If you want friends, be a friend. Barnabas encouraged. He encouraged others by making friends. Okay, let's go. Point number two, after you establish a friendship, be a partner. Be a partner with people. Boy, do I know some owners in life. They're going to fly that plane by themselves if it goes to the side of a mountain. They don't care. They're not going to partner with anybody. Uh, I'll give you the context in Acts chapter uh, 11 real quick. The, the new Jewish people who had been converted to Christianity all over Jerusalem were being persecuted. They were being persecuted by the Jews. And they told them they were crazy. They were being persecuted by uh, everybody. Uh, the, the Greeks, the Gentiles, said, oh, you know, I don't know about that. Y'all uh, didn't like us when you were Jews. I know you're not going to like us now that you're a Gentile. You're a saved Gentile. And so they didn't like them. Uh, then that you were saved Jew. I mean. And they began, to, the Jews couldn't take it anymore. They began to leave. It was called the Dispora. They decided they better get out of town. So they left Jerusalem and they started going to all the little towns around. They'd go to the next town and preach, preach a while and go to the next town and go to the next town. And as they did that, they, the people became saved. And they would grab one of them. Each of those would grab one of those, partner with one of those. And then they'd go on to the next town together, two by two. And they'd witness and they'd partner. Well, uh, word got back to Jerusalem that that's what they were doing, those Jews. And that a revival had broken out in Antioch, one of the towns not too far away. They had to go through... Uh, Cyprus and Serene and a couple of other towns to get to Antioch. But Paul and all those heard that uh, a revival had broken up in Antioch. And so they said, well, I don't know about that. And we heard Paul, they're preaching to the Gentiles now too. Hmm. And dangerous. Okay, well, I'll tell you what we better do. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch to check it out. They said, they, they didn't believe it either, I guess. They sent uh, Barnabas to Antioch. Here's what Acts chapter 11 said. Now they which were scattered abroad, that's those converted Jews, upon the persecution that arose, traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Serene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Greeks also. They spoke to the Greeks also. Bingo, we got a new project in town. We got a new idea. And we have new partnerships as well. Preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed. And turned to the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church. Which was in Jerusalem. Uh, and they sent uh, forth Barnabas. That he should go as far as Antioch. When he got to Antioch. He came and he saw the grace of God. 
He said, this is the real deal. These folks are actually the real deal. And so he was glad. And he encouraged, he exhorted them all uh, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. And he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Do you see it there? What did he do? He taught how to be a friend. And then he taught how to partner up with people. Don't try to do it all on your own. Partner up with somebody and go out and talk to people about the Lord. Number one, you'll be encouraged. Number two, they'll be encouraged. And number three, it's a win-win-win. The Lord likes it too. New ideas and new projects usually die. You know it. In your place of business or wherever you are, somebody comes up with a new idea and they just folks don't want to hear about new ideas. No, we didn't. No, uh -uh. we ain't starting nothing new now. I'm too old to begin something new now. New ideas die quickly and projects die quickly. Why? Well, one of two reasons. The first one's negativity. You've been there, you've seen it. You come up with <laughs> you come up with what you consider to be the best idea. Like Pat came up with the idea of a hula hoop one time, and everybody shot her down. You crazy? You're gonna get a piece of plastic and, and staple it together, put it around you and shake it and roll with it? Come on, Pat. Negativity. New idea. Negativity. Well, somebody made our fortune on that, didn't they? <laughs> That's what happens. People get negative. Nah, we tried that before, that won't work. No, we can't do that. No, we're going we to keep on doing what we're doing and fail. <laughs> we don't want to listen to you. That's one reason. And the second one reason is trying to do it all yourself. You can't do it. You can't do it usually. You need to partner with somebody. I, I, I'll digress just for a moment. This week we had our, our leadership meeting here at the church. And I am so grateful. I am so grateful for the leadership team, for Lisa and Roger and Carol and Sharon and Cam. And of course, Barbara's always there. Melissa usually comes and Pat comes. And I tell you, they, they friend up when they get there. It's amazing. It's amazing. And they encourage one another. This meeting this past week was supposed to be maximum 30 minutes. Remember that? <laughs> you bet. It went an hour and a half. Now, why was that? Well, we finished all our old business in 25 minutes. I was getting ready to bring you home. And then I said, well, no, wait a minute. Let me, let me approach you with this new idea that I have about a way to, uh, to reach the community, outreach idea. I think, think it might uh, be something we need to take a look at. And I sat down and I laid out the, the, uh, just my initial thoughts on it. About it. talked about it a little bit. Something we haven't done here since I've been here at any rate. And let me tell you, it wasn't long before I think the first one was Carol. She jumped in head over heels and started telling, well, we can do this and we can do that. And who's going to do that? And somebody needs to do that. And we need to feed this and, 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 and boom. And Roger came along and said, well, you know, we need to feed them. And, and we got grills and we got people. And who's going to Well, we can work serving out. You know, we can get served. We, and boy, oh boy, oh boy, did, did they get encouraged. And I got encouraged. And everybody got encouraged. We sat there for another hour talking about that thing. Uh, by the way, August the 14th, 5 to 7 p.m. So we're going to have it. <laughs> but you'll hear more about it. But the point is, that's a great example. Ideas, that idea could have died right there in that meeting. Could have, sure. Somebody would say, I don't know, Tom, we tried that a few years ago. It just didn't work. I mean, we spent a ton of money and didn't see any results from it. Well, that might be true. Let's do it again, maybe. Let's explore it anyway. Uh, three types of people. There are risk takers. And I'm a risk taker, sometimes to my chagrin. But I will take a look at a new idea in a heartbeat. So there are risk takers. There are also caretakers. They wouldn't come up with a new idea if the world was in. They would sit back and watch you fail all in. But they're not going to have anything to do with it. And then there are undertakers. <laughs> they're going to make sure that idea dies because they don't want any part of it. They're undertakers. So partner up with somebody. Partner up with someone right here. Get a friend. Be a friend. Get a friend. And our best way to do it, like you did it in the first century, go out to the unsaved person to become a friend. Give him the gospel. He's saved. He comes to church. He's he doesn't know so. He's scared, slapped to death, sitting out there. Who are all these people? And what do I say next? And how? Be his friend. And then partner up with him. And, and the two of you go and do something big for the Lord. Big for the Lord. Don't rule out the ideas. The next one is be generous. Be generous. Uh, I could have put stewardship up there, but be generous is a better term. Barnabas had personal land, and he sold it, and he brought the money.
to the local people and laid it at the apostles' feet. You remember a few months ago we preached from Acts chapter 2 when the up, uh, in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost and the, uh, the rushing wind came and the, the uh, tongues were given and uh, all of those many, many, many thousands of people outside heard that, heard that language going off and, it, and they said, wow, what is going on up there? They must be drunk. And Peter couldn't take it. He said, no, nope, no, nope. and he got down and started preaching. Remember that? And he preached, and boom, oh, I mean, he let them hold it. And 3,000 people got saved. That, one, that was the very first sermon ever in the very first church ever. <laughs> and 3,000 people got saved. Now, that's a pretty good day's work. You know that? Well, then he said, okay, here's what we're going to do, boys. You remember that, Acts chapter 2? He said, they, they were uh, devoted daily to teaching and to prayer and to fellowship and going from house to house. And then it says something about their community. It said, all they that believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods. Difference between a possession and a good. And parted them to all men. Next uh, internet phrase. As they had need. As they had need. It wasn't a welfare program where you stick your hand out and get the money just for being in line. As they had need. That was the first example of, a, of generosity in the church right there. First church, first sermon, one of the first things they did was they learned how to be gen generous. Here's how I take that. If I got tomato plants and you don't have any tomato plants, I'll give you some of my tomato plants. If you give me some of your corn plants, because I don't have any corn. You got too much corn. I got too much tomatoes. We work this deal out. That's what was happening there. They shared their goods. Communal living, if you will. But they shared their goods as they had need and as they had opportunity. So, you remember I said find an eat and fill it? That's where it came from. The proper word, though, probably about this be generous thing is, is manage. Manage. Because you know what? You don't own it anyway. <laughs> you don't own it anyway. You know that it all comes from God. And so if he owns it, how can I uh, make a decision? I can manage it for him and give it back to him when the time comes. The principle of generosity, though, is not just about money. It's about time. And it's about resources. I'm going to do a, a series here very soon on spiritual gifts. Each one of us in this room has at least one spiritual gift. I hope you know yours. But if you don't, uh, you're going to find out. Because we're going to do a series on it. And we're going to take tests to show us how to, what our spiritual gift or gifts are. And they may, he may give you another one two or three years from now. And so you say, well, I did that five years ago. I don't need to do that. You don't know. He may have given you another one, but you don't recognize it. Some people have the gift of music and singing. Some have the gift of helps. Some have the gift of prayer. Some have the gift of encouragement or teaching or whatever. But everybody has at least one. And I would say if God gave me a gift, then he gave it to me for a reason. He didn't give it to me to hoard. He gave it to me to use, to display and to do something with it. That if nothing else, take it down to the church and lay it at the feet of the apostles like, like, uh, like Barnabas did with his land. You know, give it, put it in work and use, put it in work. If I take an a, a, a ear of corn out of my field and I eat all of it, every ear of corn there is in there, I'm not going to have any more corn next year because I don't have any seeds. If I take that all those corn and ears, every one of them, put them over here in the barn, well, I got one year's worth of, of uh, corn, but I'm not going to grow any more next year because I didn't plant any seeds. The only way to make my crop grow is to plant seeds. Amen? Amen. 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 Take that to the bank on time, you folks. Take it to the bank. Well, uh, what did Peter, James, and John remember? Uh, I think we did this last week when it, it, they went up to the temple and there was a lame man laying there begging. He'd been lame all his life. And he was begging for money. Uh, he said, uh, Peter says, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I'll give it to you. And that's what he did. He used his gift. He said, arise and walk. And what did the man do? <laughs> oh, he arose and walked. Hallelujah. He made a friend. Partner up. Be generous. Peter and his friend, John, were the two that were there. And he was generous with his gift of healing. 
When we're generous with our overages, people are encouraged, we're encouraged, God wins, everybody wins. In fact, it's a command. In uh, uh, Galatians chapter 6, be ye one, uh, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then, this is interesting, if people beat you up about tithing and giving extra, listen to this. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. As we have opportunity, you can't give what you don't have. Now, it may be your fault you don't have it. But uh, be generous with what you do have. Well, oh, I got $10, I got $100 worth of bill. Be generous with that $10. Now, don't be generous with $90 because you don't have $90. But be generous. As we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those that are of the household of faith. It seems like several places in the Bible when they talk about giving uh, uh, of their monetary assets to the Lord, they were, number one priority was believers in the church. You know, there are homeless people and there are hungry people all over the world and they go looking for help. And a lot of that is genuine. Some of it's not. And uh, you'll notice that a lot of churches will ask, first of all, where are you a member? And they think, oh, you're just trying to dodge the deal. No, he's not. That's what it says right there. Especially those who are of the household. Are you, where are you a member? That's the people that should be looking out after you first. And then if they don't want to do anything, then it's uh, other people. So be generous. It's encouraging. Amen? I'm going to do a series on that spiritual gift, and we're just going to see where that gets us. Then we'll finish with the fourth one. The fourth one is, uh, well, that ain't it, but that's all right. There's the fourth one. <laughs> be a rebuilder. Be a rebuilder, not a builder. You can be a builder too, but be sure you're a rebuilder. What is a rebuilder? That's, that's someone who restores hurt feelings. Restores hurt feelings. He repairs broken relationships. He helps pick up people when they're down and out. When they've stumbled, maybe. Or maybe even if they've fallen into sin. And they quit worshiping God. They quit on God. They've got out of the habit, so to speak. Help pick them up. Uh, you'll encourage them. And they'll get back. That's a win-win again. By the way, don't beat them up. Don't lecture them. Didn't say do that. I said, I said encourage them. Acts chapter 15. Some days after, as Paul said to Barnabas, listen to what Paul now said to Barnabas. And Paul had been out there, and Barnabas too. Uh, Paul had been starting churches. Barnabas had been his right-hand man for years and years. At least three missionary trips. And this is what Paul says. And someday afterwards, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the Word of God and see how they do. You get the import of that. Paul was saying to Barnabas, Barnabas, we've seen a lot of people saved in a lot of different churches, in a lot of different towns. And I suspect by now some of them have a problem or two. Let's go see how they're doing. If there's hard feelings, if there's a sin in the camp, if there's whatever, let's see what we can do to restore and rebuild that relationship. This is not something that a psychiatrist made up. This is biblical right here. And I suspect that it worked for them. It worked for them. They stopped assembling themselves, maybe. Maybe they fell into sin. Maybe they got their feelings hurt over a church split or something. Let's repair. Let's not lecture. Let's not spread rumors. Let's not throw gasoline on the fuss. But let's repair and rebuild. The local church, it's been, <laughs> it's been said, the local church is the only army that shoots its wounds. We do, don't we? Oh, I tell you what, somebody falls out of the will of God, and the next thing you know, he is criticized, ridiculed, his name put up on the billboard. He sinned yesterday! Old John did. Well, so what? Jimmy, boy, you ought to see what that guy's doing now. He calls himself a Christian. Well, he might be a Christian, and he might be in sin. If that close him out, one day he might be tempted the same way. Amen. Don't lecture, don't find fault, don't spread rumors. Don't start another fight, for Pete's sake. Let's see what you can do towards healing the wound, rebuilding. Galatians 6. <clears throat> Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, now that's a, a, a stumbling block, or a, we call him a backslider. 
If a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, first of all, <laughs> ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meek. Do it meekly. In the spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest thyself also be tempted. Be careful what you say. <laughs> you may have suffered the same test and failed. And I'll tell you this in a moment. I look at our church directories, and every church has them. You know, those picture books where you get your picture taken and you put your, your contact information all in there. And they're great. Man, I, I, Pat and I use them all the time. Well, what's so and so's last name? I can't remember. We're talking about three churches back. We're going to get the picture book and look it up and find out. And then we know, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, they're great tools, church directories. But I've noticed something, and I say it finally. But I noticed something here, and in a lot of churches, not just this one. Um, you know, we've got one here, I think, for 2000, like maybe somewhere back there in 2005 or seven. Around 2013, 2018, I think was the last one. There's another one I've got a hold of somewhere. And as I went through that, trying to become acquainted with the membership, I couldn't help but go back and look at each one. And I said, well, I don't remember seeing that name anywhere else. I don't remember seeing that face over there in the other books. You won't believe how many people were in 2013's book that wasn't in 2015. And you can't believe that many were in 2015's book, wasn't in 2018's book. And I'm going, where'd they go? Holy mackerel. <laughs> if everybody in all those books was here, we'd have to read the Civic Center. Something's going on there. Maybe they fell into sin. Uh, maybe they stumbled and fell into sin. Maybe they got their feelings hurt somehow. And it was a fuss and a row. You know, that happens. Everywhere except Baptist churches. <laughs> I just wonder. I just wonder if reaching out in restoration might not be the answer. Repair and rebuild. Paul said, other one was said. Jack, I don't have time to preach it, but in Acts chapter 15, it's a perfect example. You get home looking up Acts 15. Uh, Barnabas and Paul were getting ready to go on a mission trip. I'll just teach. I'll just run through the teaching of it real quick. Marcus and Paul went on a mission trip and they needed some help. And so they said, uh, said, uh, Barnabas, get, uh, get some help. We're going to need some help. Barnabas said, you remember that guy named Mark? I'm going to go get Mark. No, Paul said. Paul said, no, 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 no. Don't get Mark. No, -uh. no, no, no. Don't want anything to do with Mark. He quit on me one time and he did. He quit on me. He's a quitter. He's a failure. I'm not going to have anything to do with him. Get somebody else. What had happened, what had happened was uh, Mark went out with Paul on a missionary trip. He was a young kid. Had been saved long. They had been away from home ever before in his life. They got to some town out in the boonies. And he got homesick or something. And he just wanted to go back home. He said, Paul, i got to go back home. And he did. Well, Paul didn't like that at all. And he took, he got sideways with Mark. And so it stayed that way. Stayed that way. He just never, never adjusted, never rebuilt. And then uh, uh, just before, uh, well, uh, then there was another trip where, uh, in fact, on that trip, what Barnabas says, I tell you what we'll do, Paul. I got, I got it for you. I know what we'll do. Only encourage your Barnabas is always looking for a way to heal something and fix it. He said, tell you what. You go get Silas, Paul, because y'all are bay buddies. Y'all have already partnered up. And you and Silas go out on a missionary trip. And I'll take Mark with me. And we'll go out on a missionary trip. Paul said, okay, that's fine. So now what do we have? Two missionary uh, teams and still one. Don't you reckon that worked? Romans 8, 28, all things, all things, all things, all things. Work together for good with them and love the Lord. Barnabas, trying to rebuild a relationship, at least with Mark at this point, took him on a missionary trip. Great, great, great things happened. The last of the story is years later, Paul was in prison. He was about to die. He knew he was going to die uh, from, uh, uh, from captivity. Uh, they'd kill him if he didn't die of bad health. And, uh, but he was still ministering. He, was, he had prison ministry going on while he was in jail. 
And they gave him a little bit of free reign. He ministered all over the place in, in that prison and every other prison he could get his hands on. And uh, he wrote a letter to, uh, to uh, Timothy. To Timothy. He says, Timothy, I need your help. You know, I'm getting old. I don't have much longer to do this. But bless the Lord, I'm not going to But I need some help. Would you come and help me in this prison ministry? Uh, and oh, by the way, go by and get that young guy, Mark, and bring him with you. <laughs> he wasn't young anymore. That's the very same guy that Paul said, I don't want anything to do with him. You see, Paul knew that he needed to rebuild a relationship, even the Apostle Paul. And they did. He needed to rebuild. And so Paul reached out and they brought, uh, and they brought Mark. Uh, and great things happen. Well, there you go. Number four, we rebuild. So, I'll close with this. I'll close with something you want. Maybe that one. I don't know what happened in the close there. Anyway, I'll just go run through the four points for you one more time. But uh, we can't. Uh, we, we need to. We need to encourage people, church. We need to encourage people for our own sake, if not for the Lord's sake. We need to. We need to make friends with people, partner with people, be generous with people, and and rebuild. Stand with me, please, for one text. First Thessalonians chapter five. Paul was exhorting the church to grow. He was exhorting it. What did he say to the church that, that, uh, that would help them grow? He said, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, but comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak, be patient towards all men. Comfort the feeble-minded. What does that mean? That's what he was talking about. Telling them about. <laughs> if you look up in Strong's Concordance what the feeble-minded meant, it came from two words originally. Two words. It came from the word so, uh, small, small, and it came from the word so. And so a feeble minded person was a person with a small soul. Now, what does that mean? Small soul. A small soul person, his mind, his will, and his emotions need to grow some. He needs some encouragement. He's depressed. His soul is shrunk. He has a small soul. They call him feeble mind. Some people call him faint hearted. Some texts and verses says faint hearted. That's what that's what uh, Paul said then. To grow the church, encourage the, the uh, discouraged. Encourage them. And I think that's I think we need to encourage. We need to grow some souls. That's what we need to do. You know somebody with a soul that needs growing? I need to work on it. Make it a goal. Make it a goal. You want to be a better father on Father's Day? Encourage the children. Amen. Encourage it. I saw a post this morning. Oh, I thank my God for my, 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 God for my dad. And never did. He loved me. He encouraged me. And boy, that works every time. You encourage it. Your grandparents, same thing. Moms and dads, teachers, church members, whatever. Learn how to encourage people. Make friends. Partner with people. Be generous and restore them. And watch. What God will do. He just never can tell. It might turn the town upside down, just like it did in Acts chapter 2. What are we singing, Melissa? Near the cross. Near the cross. I'm going to give the invitation. I don't know what your need is today, and if you need to talk to me about it, amen. We'll do it, and I'll be more than happy to pray with you. But you certainly need to talk to the Lord if you have a need. You do that today as well. As we sing, Melissa.